Good afternoon, everybody, and you're most welcome to this session uh, with uh, the First Minister of Wales, uh, Mark uh, Drakeford. Um, I want to thank the Welsh Government Office in Dublin, uh, and particularly Catherine Hallett, uh, for their help in uh, putting this meeting together. Uh, it couldn't have been done uh, without them. Um, and uh, before I introduce the First Minister, uh, I'd just like to say that uh, he would speak for about 20 minutes. Uh, if you have questions to ask, uh, you can use uh, the facilities on the Zoom, uh, which you can see on your screen, and you can feel, be free to send your questions throughout the session as they occur to you. And uh, then I will, I will go into them as soon as the First Minister has finished. Uh, his, his, his speech. Let me remind you that uh, today's presentation and the, in both the presentation and the question and answers uh, are on the record. Uh, I think this uh, meeting is taking place at a, at a very useful time because on St. David's Day earlier this year, the Irish and Welsh governments uh, agreed a, a, a new shared statement and a joint action plan uh, for the period from 2021 to 2025. And I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, the First Minister uh, tell us what he has in mind about uh, putting flesh on the bones of this joint action plan, uh, which, which is an important event. I also want to say how pleased I am to see that the Irish consulate in Cardiff uh, has been uh, reopened, uh, regrettably, uh, it, it was closed uh, some time after I left London, where I had the, the pleasure to be the Irish ambassador in London. Mark Drayford, who has uh, an academic record, uh, he became a member of the Assembly in Cardiff for the first time in 2011. Uh, and he became First Minister in uh, 2018. Um, those of us who watch uh, British television, and I'm sure many of us watch British television, will have noticed how steady his hand was uh, and how good his communication skills uh, during the, the COVID uh, crisis. Um, there's a, an article recently in The Guardian, and I quote, uh, which states that, quote, there is a strong argument that the British politician whose reputation has been most enhanced by the challenges of the last 18 months is Mark Drakeford. So it is a very great pleasure for me to invite the First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, uh, to address us. The floor is yours, First Minister. Thank you. Well, David, uh, dear dear of course, he did. Uh, Chair, thank you very much indeed uh, for that very kind uh, introduction uh, and for the opportunity uh, to be with you in this webinar uh, today. Very grateful indeed to the IEA for uh, the invitation uh, and to those who helped to make all this happen. Uh, now, you, you said quite rightly that I've been a member of the Senev here since 2011, but one way or another, I have knocked about uh, in devolution here in Wales since the very beginning uh, of it. Uh, I was um, a very good friend far before devolution uh, with Rodri Morgan, uh, the first First Minister uh, of uh, Wales, and uh, came to head up his political office when he became uh, First Minister. Uh, Rodri was the most tremendous enthusiast uh, for Welsh-Irish relations. Uh, he could have named every fullback and probably every other position as well that had played in any Welsh-Irish uh, rugby match in the last half century. Uh, and uh, I remember very clearly that in the very early days of devolution, uh, he came uh, to Dublin to take part in an event like uh, this uh, in the, uh, with the 
IIEA in your uh, office, your premises in Dublin. And it would be great uh, to have been with you uh, today. Now, he, Rodri was there in the spring of 20, uh, of the year 2000. So devolution was less than a year old. Uh, and he was there in a way to celebrate one of the key arguments that persuaded people in Wales to vote for devolution in the referendum of 1997, because unlike Scotland, there hadn't been a long uh, cross-party, cross-society campaign for devolution. And one of the few arguments that united people across all of those sort of perspectives was the slogan that devolution would give Wales a stronger voice in Europe. Uh, it was, you know, a really powerful theme in the foundation of devolution. And Rodri's visit across to Ireland was, you know, a demonstration of the fact that from the earliest stirrings of Welsh government, we were very keen to make a reality uh, of that promise. Well, a generation later, we clearly find ourselves in very dramatically changed circumstances. Outside the European Union, coping and aiming to recover from the pandemic, which remains a dominant uh, factor in Welsh life today, working inside a divided and very often fractious uh, United Kingdom, and with an uncertain future in front of us, confronted as we all are, you know, across internal and external boundaries by that other huge crisis of our time, uh, the challenge of climate change. So I'm going to focus, Chair, on three issues. They're related uh, issues, but I'll take them sequentially. I'm going to say something about the ongoing impact of uh, Brexit here in Wales and in terms of Wales's relationships with other parts of uh, Europe. I'm going to focus in the middle of what I have to say uh, by Welsh-Irish relations and particularly the statement that we agreed together and published back on the 1st of March uh, this year. And I'll end by saying something about the state of the United Kingdom uh, itself. They say these things are uh, intertwined with one another, uh, but I'll take them in that order and then make a few final sort of summing up uh, suggestions. So I should uh, begin, as I always do, by saying that uh, the Welsh Government uh, campaigned to remain in the European Union, believed the world's future was best secured by continuing uh, membership. Uh, we failed to persuade a sufficient number of our fellow citizens in Wales of that proposition. And much as we might to regret that, our focus, once the referendum was held, was not on the fact of Brexit, because that was decided in a referendum, but on the form of Brexit. And our main disagreements with successive UK governments ever since June 2016 has been on the way in which they went about negotiating the leaving of the European Union and the future relationship that we could have. We argued for a very different economic relationship, one in which we would have stayed in the single market, would have stayed in the customs uh, union, uh, and then would have negotiated a different set of political arrangements between the UK and the continuing members of the union. Different and better deals were available, and our biggest regret is that we failed to persuade the UK government uh, to take them. Uh, now, today, it seems to me that the air is pretty thick with the sound of Brexit, chickens, 
uh, coming home to roost. Uh, one of the things that I'll return to more towards the end is the way in which Brexit has deepened fissures that were here inside the UK and exacerbated nationalisms, including nationalism here uh, in Wales, which were there before Brexit, but have been given a new prominence and uh, a new sort of fuel in the tank from the Brexit uh, experience. Uh, in practical terms, in economic uh, terms, we see uh, every day uh, the price that we are paying from uh, the trade and cooperation agreement. As we predicted from the very start, uh, we have seen the end within a matter of weeks of the seafood industry that had been painfully but enthusiastically uh, grown in the north of Wales, particularly often using European Union funding to promote that growth. It was a thriving industry by the time we left the European Union. 90% of its products were exported uh, to the southern parts of the European Union. And within five weeks, that industry was over. You know, it's one gallant attempt to send products from Wales to the south of France just ended in complete failure. By the time the goods arrived there, with the many holdups that were now in its path, they were simply unsaleable. And that industry just does not exist today in the way that it did only a very short period uh, ago. Communities in Hollyhead, in Fishguard, in Pembroke Dock, have seen a substantial fall in trade flows and a corresponding drop in economic uh, activity. Where Welsh supermarkets have empty shelves, it is because we do not have hauliers, we do not have HGV uh, drivers to carry on uh, what previously was straightforward commercial activity. Today, all is in both directions, inconvenienced by red tape, where before uh, there was none. The cost of doing business rising significantly. Products which passed freely across our maritime border for decades, now subject to costly delays and checks. And we haven't seen, we haven't seen yet uh, the real impacts because they are further delayed to take back control, the UK government said, of our borders. And yet, you know, just the last few days has had to announce a further extension to the point in which goods coming into the UK uh, will be subject to, to those checks. Uh, so in so many uh, aspects uh, of our lives, uh, we have seen the direct impact of the Brexit deal uh, that was uh, struck. Uh, and from a Welsh government uh, perspective, those impacts have been damaging uh, to our economy uh, and have created new barriers to many of those things that we have built up uh, together over so many uh, years. Now, for us, that means in the Welsh Government that we know that we have to work harder, we have to be outward looking, we have to put more effort into explaining to people elsewhere that Wales remains a welcoming place connected to the rest of the world, wanting to make sure that we go on having strong bilateral relationships with key regional governments elsewhere uh, in the world. And these often have, you know, a Celtic and linguistic component uh, to them. Our links with Brittany, uh, our links with a Basque country, and of course, with a member state uh, level, uh, with 
uh, the Republic uh, of Ireland. Uh, those bilateral relationships, I think, are all the more important when we no longer have the, the oil in those relationships, the membership of the European Union created for us, those opportunities to meet, those chances to discuss that occurred naturally by our joint participation in European Union uh, forums, now we have to do more to recreate them in other ways and to give them a new form uh, of substance. Uh, and as you said, Chair, in opening nowhere, has that been more important for us than in reaffirming our relationships with uh, Ireland? We have, thank goodness, very glad indeed to have the reopened consulate here uh, in Cardiff. And as you said, we have a reciprocal arrangement with a Welsh Government office uh, in uh, Dublin. And the shared statement and action plan that uh, Minister Simon Coveney and I were able to sign on St David's Day codifies a set of areas in which we are committed to go on working even more closely uh, together over the year uh, ahead. There are six themes in the cooperation uh, agreement, political and official engagement, climate and sustainability, trade and tourism, education and research, cultural language and heritage, communities, diaspora uh, and sport. I'm not going to cover all of those in the time uh, that uh, we have uh, today. Let me just pick out uh, maybe three or four uh, of them. On deepening political engagement, uh, the agreement commits uh, us to an annual meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting between ministers in the Irish government and ministers in the Welsh government. Uh, the first of these will happen later this autumn when a group of Irish ministers will come uh, to Wales. We are working really hard to make the very most we can of that uh, opportunity to, to get that whole political engagement process off to the best possible start. Looking forward hugely to welcoming the delegation here to Cardiff to make sure that there are opportunities for bilateral meetings with uh, ministers, with other groups, academic institutions, third sector organisations around the other themes uh, in the agreement. Uh, climate change, uh, as I said, it's that, it's that huge challenge uh, of our time, and we share that enormously important uh, natural resource, the Irish Sea. Uh, and we have already, through the uh, work that we have done over 20 years between our universities, uh, a set of investments in making sure that we have the best understanding of that natural resource, that our shipping and our fishing in the sea is done in a sustainable uh, way, and that we find new ways to draw on that asset in the creation of new renewable energy sources for the future. You know, marine energy is enormously important to the future of Wales and to the future of Ireland uh, as well. And there are a whole series of practical ways in which we're taking that forward together. The Celtic Sea Alliance, a partnership between Wales, Ireland, Cornwall and the Isles of uh, Scilly. Uh, the Simply Blue Energy uh, Development joint initiatives, Welsh companies, Irish uh, companies developing floating wind and other marine energy uh, possibilities uh, between us. The first gigawatt of floating energy in the Celtic Sea could provide over 3,000 jobs, jobs on both sides of the Irish Sea, and nearly £700 million in supply chain opportunities in less than a decade in less than 10 years uh, ahead. It is just an enormously important uh, resource. And the agreement commits us to doing more together on it. 
And when Irish ministers are here in Wales, one of the things we will want to focus on is making sure that we are working together in the best possible way to get the most out of those opportunities. Uh, as I said, that will build on the research capacity that we have developed through the Wales Island European Territorial Cooperation Programme. Uh, and it's one of our deep regrets uh, that the UK government was not prepared to go on investing in inter-territorial cooperation uh, programmes, not just between Wales and Ireland, but other cooperation programmes uh, as well. But we're not going to throw away the 20 years of investment that we've laid down, and part of the agreement we've struck will give new opportunities to make sure that the research component in marine, in energy and other parts of the marine uh, agenda are taken forward together. Uh, Chair, there's so many other uh, aspects uh, of the uh, agreement. Let me maybe just uh, focus on one. One of the other huge regrets that we had uh, about the Brexit uh, the way in which we negotiated Brexit was that the UK government uh, failed to secure a future for Welsh young people uh, in the Erasmus Plus programme. Uh, Erasmus was a programme uh, invented and uh, developed by the most senior uh, Welsh uh, civil servant in the uh, European Union, uh, Howell Kerry Jones, who uh, many of you will, uh, will know. Uh, not to find that young people in Wales no longer have access to everything that comes with Erasmus Plus is a matter of huge regret, an act of cultural vandalism, if I quote the First Minister of Scotland. Uh, and we have been not at all satisfied with the alternative arrangements that the UK government has put in place. So we have found from our own resources a very significant sum of money uh, to develop our own scheme for young people in Wales. Young people, of course, in our higher education institutions, but in further education, in our youth service uh, as well. And I, I, I just want to say a huge thanks to the Irish uh, government uh, for the uh, the warmth of their willingness to make sure that there are opportunities for young people from Ireland and from Wales to continue to travel, to work, to study, to volunteer here in Wales for young people from Ireland and in Ireland for young people uh, from Wales. You know, we have Irish language courses in our universities in Cardiff and in uh, Aberystwyth where young people uh, study our common heritage in Celtic uh, languages and our new programme, uh, which is part of the agreement that we signed on St David's Day, is just one more example. There are many more uh, of how that agreement will further cement the relationships between us. Uh, shall I say something briefly about how all of this plays into uh, relations within the United Kingdom uh, itself? I'm a unionist to the extent that I believe that uh, Wales's future is best secured by entrenched devolution, where decisions that apply only in Wales are made only by people in Wales, but where we choose to pool, to pool our sovereignty with other parts of the United Kingdom for common purposes. Common purposes in defence, in foreign affairs, in dealing with climate change. Uh, as well. But I do think that the Union is under threat in a way that it has never been in my political lifetime. David Liddington, Mrs May's Deputy Prime Minister, said in a speech in Cambridge in May uh, that he thought the United Kingdom was under greater threat than at any time that he could remember, and he reminded his audience that there is nothing inevitable about the United Kingdom staying together. For the United Kingdom to stay together, those of us who believe in its future have to create a compelling vision for people to make it something that people want to continue to be membership of, that they remain in membership, not because they are browbeaten into it or scared into it, 
but because it offers them a future that they want to sign up to. Uh, you can't do that through the course of action that the current UK government has adopted, a sort of muscular unionism, where bigger flags, more choruses of Rule Britannia, uh, larger buildings with the UK logo on the front of them in other parts of the United Kingdom. None of that will work. In fact, what it does is it strengthens uh, the determination of those people who believe that a different future, a future of separation, uh, would be uh, preferable. It doesn't have to be like that. A well-functioning union based on a fair distribution of resources and respect for each of the four constituent nations of a voluntary uh, union seems to me to give us the basis in which we can continue to work together. The United Kingdom as a powerful engine of redistribution and an engine for working together uh, on those challenges that don't stop at any border of which climate change, the degradation in our natural uh, environment, the loss of biodiversity, all of those seem to me to be really powerful reasons for why Welsh citizens would choose to be part of the sort of union that we have outlined in the Welsh Government's recent republication of our strengthening, reforming the union uh, document. Let me uh, end, Chair, by uh, also pointing to some of the other intergovernmental mechanisms that I think can help to uh, deal with a number of the dilemmas we face, of which the British Irish Council, I think, is, uh, in our experience, the uh, outstandingly the most important one. It will meet in Cardiff uh, in November, uh, this year. Uh, it, it is a place where the word British is not a sort of monocultural uh, expression of the UK government's idea of what to be British might be. Uh, it is a prism where uh, the Isle of Man, the government of Guernsey, of Scotland, of Wales, of Jersey, as well as of Northern Ireland and the uh, Republic of Ireland come together to share common views, uh, well, to express views on topics of common uh, interest. I think the British Irish Council could be strengthened. I think it could do more. It could help to cement relationships between its component parts. Uh, and in an era where, as I said, those other ways of coming into contact with one another have diminished, then I think its significance as a forum increases. Its relationship with parliamentary uh, forums uh, that bring the different parliaments across the United Kingdom and the island of Ireland together is another way in which I think that forum is ripe for development and strengthening. And if we do that, then we do have a future in which those common challenges can be uh, addressed, uh, can be addressed in a way that gives our different peoples confidence that by working together, uh, we achieve more on their behalf than we can uh, when we regard each other with suspicion uh, or as enemies to be outmaneuvered. Uh, that is absolutely not the way in which the Welsh Government sees uh, our future. Uh, and in reinforcing our position as an outward-looking, welcoming country, determined to play our part, small as it sometimes might be, in working with others, uh, no relationship is more important to us than the one that we have with Ireland. I'll check you from out. Thank you very much indeed.